chapter forty seven of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty seven mischief in a household it seems that no sooner did parson chowne discover how cleverly i had escaped him after leaving my mark behind in a way rather hard to put up with than he began to cast about to win the last stroke somehow and this not over me alone but over a very much greater man who had carried me off so shamefully that is to say captain bampfylde heaviside was not there as yet but with us in the alcestis so that he could not describe exactly the manner of chowne's appearance only he heard from the people there that never had such terror seized the house within human memory not that chowne attempted any violence with any one but that all observed his silence and were afraid to ask him what was done that night between sir philip and the parson or even between the parson and sir philip's heir the squire whose melancholy room that chowne had dared to force himself into nobody seemed to be sure although every one craved to have better knowledge but it was certain that isabel carey went to her room very early that night and would have no nanette for her hair and in the morning was not fit for any one to look at unless it were one who loved her great disturbances of this sort happen by some law of nature often in large households give me the quiet cottage where a little row just now and then comes to pass and is fought out and lapses when its heat is over into very nice explanations and women's heads laid on men's shoulders and tears that lose their way in smiles and reproach that melts into self-reproach however this was not the sort of thing that any sane person could hope for in thirty miles distance from master stoyle chowne after once displeasing him and what do you think parson chowne did now or at least i mean soon afterwards that night he had pressed his attentions on the beautiful young lady so that in simple self-defence she was forced to show her spirit this aroused the power of darkness always lurking in him so that his eyes shone and his jaws met and his forehead was very smooth for he had a noble forehead and the worse his state of mind might be the calmer was his upper brow after frightening poor miss carey not with words but want of them which is a far more alarming thing when a man encounters women he took out his rights in the house by having an interview with sir philip and no one could make any guess about what passed between them only it could not be kept from knowledge of the household that parson chowne obtained or took admission to squire philip also of this unhappy gentleman very little has been said because i then knew so little i am always the last man in the world to force myself into private things in finding out once that i must not ask never to ask is my rule of action unless i know the people however it does not look as if master heaviside had been gifted with any of this rare delicacy and thus he discovered as follows squire philip's brain was not so strong as captain bampfylde's he had been very good at figures while things went on quietly also able to ride round and see the tenants and deal with them as the heir to a large estate should do the people thought him very good and that was about the whole of it he never hunted he never shot he did not even care for fishing a man may do without these things if he gets repute in other ways especially in witchcraft but if he cannot show good cause for sticking thus inside four walls an english neighbourhood is apt to set him down for a milksop and tenfold thus if he has the means to ride the best horse and to own the best dogs and to wear the best breeches that are to be bought squire philip must not be regarded however with prejudice he had good legs and a very good seat and his tailor said the same of him 
also he took no objection to the scattering of a fox with nothing left for his brush to sweep up and his smell made into incense nor was the squire from any point of view or of feeling squeamish nevertheless he did not give satisfaction as he should have done he meant well but he did not outspeak it only because to his quiet nature that appeared so needless and the rough rude world undervalued him because he did not overvalue himself this was the man who had withdrawn after deep affliction into a life or a death of his own abandoning hope too rapidly he had been blessed or cursed by nature with a large soft heart and not the flint in his brains there should be for a wholesome balance i know the men they are not very common and i should like to see more of them this squire philip's hair was whiter than his father's now they said and his way of sitting and of walking growing older no wonder when he never took a walk or even showed himself rather like a woman yielding who has lost her only child it is not my place to defend him all our ways are not alike to my experience he seemed bound to grieve most about his children for a man may always renew his wife more easily than his children but squire philip's view of the matter took a different starting point it was the loss of his wife that thus unwisely overcame him accordingly he had given orders for women alone to come near him because they reminded him of his wife and went all around in a flat-footed way and gave him to see that they never would ask yet gladly would know his sentiments and living thus he must have grown a little weak of mind as all men do with too much of a female circle round them what parson chowne said to this poor gentleman on the night we are speaking of was known to none except themselves and two or three maids who listened at the door because their duty compelled them thus to protect their master and all of these told different stories agreeing only upon one point but the best of them told it as follows chowne expressed his surprise and concern at the change in his ancient friend's appearance and said that it was enough to make him do what he often had threatened to do squire philip then asked what he meant by this and he answered in a deep low voice bring to justice the villain who for the sake of his own advantage has left my poor philip childless and with all the fair isabel's property too greedy greedy scoundrel they could not see the poor squire's face when these words came home to him but they knew that he fell into a chair and his voice so trembled that he could not shape his answer properly then you too think as i have feared as i have prayed as i would die rather than be forced to think my only brother and i have been so kind to him for years and years that he was strong and rough i know but such a thing such a thing as this he began to indulge his propensities for slaughter rather early i think i have heard people say yes yes that boy at school but this is a wholly different thing what had my poor wife done to him did you ever hear that drake bampfylde offered himself to the princess while you were away from home and a little before you did i never heard anything of the kind and i think that she would have told me i rather think not it would be a very delicate point for a lady however it may not be true chowne it is true from the way you say it you know it to be true and you never told me because it prevents any further doubt now i see everything everything now chowne you are one of the best of men i know that i am said the parson calmly although it does not appear to be the public opinion however that will come right in the end now my poor fellow your wisest plan will be to leave yourself altogether to a thoroughly trustworthy man do you know where to find him only in you in you my friend my father will never come to see me because you know what i mean because i dare to think what is now proved true now philip my old friend you know what i am a man who detests every kind of pretence even a little inclined perhaps to go too far the other way yes yes i have always known it you differ from other men and the great fault of your nature is bluntness 
philip you have hit the mark i could not have put it so well myself my fine fellow never smother yourself while you have such abilities alas i have no abilities chowne the whole of them went when my good luck went and if any remained to me how could i care to use them after what you have told me too my life is over my life is dead all the maids agreed at this point and would scorn to contradict that poor squire philip fell down in a lump and they must have run in with their bottles and so on only that the door was locked moreover they felt and had the courage to whisper to one another that they were a little timid of the parson's witchcraft there had been a girl in sherwell parish who went into the parson's service and because she dared to have a sweetheart on the premises she had orders for half an hour before and after the moon rose to fly up and down the river ye o from sherwell mill to pilton bridge and her own mother had seen her therefore these maids only listened all this shows a noble vein of softness in you my good friend this was the next thing they could hear it is truly good and grand what a happy thing to have a darling wife and two sweet children for the purpose of having them slain and then in the grandeur of soul forgiving it this is noble this is true love how it sets one thinking this was the last that the maids could hear for after that all was whispering only it was spread in every street and road and lane around in about twelve hours afterwards that a warrant from justices chowne and rambone and with consent of philip bampfylde was placed in the hands of the officers of the peace for the apprehension of captain drake upon a charge of murder when sir philip heard of this outrage on himself and tenfold worse upon their blameless lineage he ordered his finest horse to be saddled and put some of his army clothes on not his best for fear of vaunting but enough to know him by then he rode slowly up and down the narrow streets of barnstaple and sent for the mayor and the town council who tumbled out of their shops to meet him to these he read a copy of the warrant obtained from the head constable and asked upon what information laid such a thing had issued betwixt their respect for sir philip bampfylde and their awe of parson chowne these poor men knew not what to say but to try to be civil to every one sir philip rode home to narnton court and changed his dress and his horse as well and thus set off for chowne's house what happened there was known to none except the two parsons and the general but every one was amazed when chowne in company with parson jack rode into barnstaple at full gallop and redemanded his warrant from the head constable who held it and also caused all entries and copies thereof to be destroyed and erased as might be and for this he condescended to assign no reason in that last point he was consistent with his usual character but that he should undo his own act was so unlike himself that no one could at first believe it of course people said that it was pity for sir philip's age and character and position that made him relent so but others who knew the man better perceived that he had only acted as from the first was his intention he knew that the captain could not be taken of course for many a month to come and he did not mean to have him taken or put upon his trial for he knew right well that there was no chance of getting him convicted but by issue of that warrant he had stirred up and given shape to all the suspicions now languishing and had enabled good honest people to lay their heads together and shake them and the boldest of them to whisper that if a common man had done this deed or been called in question of it the warrant would have held its ground until he faced an impartial jury of his fellow-countrymen and what was far more to chowne's purpose he had thus contrived to spread between sir philip and his eldest son a deadly breach unlikely ever to be bridged across at all and quite sure to stand wide for healing up to the dying hour because it was given to all to know that this vile warrant issued upon oath of squire philip and by his demanding and the father's pride would never let him ask if this were so 
now people tried to pass this over as they do with unpleasant matters and to say let bygones go yet mankind will never have things smothered thus and put away when a game is begun it should be played out when a battle is fought let it be fought out these are principles quite as strong in the bosoms of spectators as in our own breasts the feeling let us live our lives out but isabel carey's wrath would not have any reason laid near it her spirit was as fine and clear almost as her lovely face was and she would not even dream that evil may get the upper hand of us she said to sir philip i will not have it i will not stay in a house where such things can be said of any one i am very nearly eighteen years old and i will not be made a child of you have been wonderfully kind and good and as dear to me as a father but i must go away now i must go away so you shall said poor sir philip it is the best thing that can be done you have another guardian more fortunate than i am and my dear you shall go to him then she clung to his neck and begged and prayed him not to think of it more only to let her stop where she was in the home of all her happiness but the general was worse to move than the rock of gibraltar whenever his honour was touched upon my dear isabel he answered you are young and i am old you were quicker than i have been to see what harm might come to you that is the very thing which i am bound to save you from my darling i love you as if you were my own daughter and this sad house will be god knows tenfold more sad without you but it must be so my child you ought to be too proud to cry when i turn you out so not to dwell upon things too much especially when grievous narnton court was compelled to get on without that bright young isabel and the female tailors who were always coming after her as well as the noble gallants who hankered every now and then for a glimpse of her beauty and property isabel carey went away to her other guardian lord pomeroy at a place where a castle of powder was and all the old people at narnton court determined not to think of it while all the young folk sobbed and cried and take it on the average a guinea a year was lost to them all this had happened for seven years now but it was that last piece of news no doubt almost as much as the warrant itself that made our captain carry on so when we were in the lime kiln because lord pomeroy had forbidden isabel to write to her lover while in this predicament he on the other hand getting no letters without knowing why or wherefore was too proud to send any to her we saw the force of this at once especially after our own correspondence under both mark and signature had for years been like the wind going where it listeth so we resolved to stop where we were upon receipt of rations and heaviside told us not to be uneasy about anything for although he durst not invite us to his own little cottage or rather his wife nanette's he stood so well in the cook's good graces that he could provide for us so he took us into the kitchen of narnton court where they made us very welcome as captain drake's retainers and told us all that had happened since the departure of miss isabel between narnton court and nympton in the first place parson chowne had been so satisfied with his mischief that he spared himself time for another wedlock taking as mrs chowne number four a young lady of some wealth and beauty but reputed such a shrew that nobody durst go near her before she had been mrs chowne a fortnight her manners were so much improved that a child might contradict her and within a month she had lost the power of frowning but had learned to sigh however she was still alive having a stronger constitution than any of the parson's former wives parson jack had also married and his wife was a good one but chowne being out of other mischief sowed such jealousies between them for his own enjoyment that poor master rambone had taken to drink and his wife was so driven that she almost did the thing she was accused of very seldom now did either of these two great parsons come to visit sir philip bampfylde not that the latter entertained any ill-will towards chowne for the matter of the warrant 
for that he blamed his own son the squire having received chowne's version of it and finding poor philip too proud and moody to offer any explanation we had not been at norton court more than a night before i saw the brave general for hearing that i was in the house and happening now to remember my name he summoned me into his private room to ask about the captain who had started off as i felt no doubt for the castle of lord pomeroy i found sir philip looking of course much older from the seven years past but as upright and dignified and trustful in the lord as ever nevertheless he must have grown weaker though he did his best to hide it for at certain things i told him of his favourite son great tears came into his eyes and his thin lips trembled and he was forced to turn away without finishing his sentences then he came back as if ashamed of his own desire to hide no shame and he put his flowing white hair back and looked at me very steadily llewellyn he said i trust in god years of trouble have taught me that i speak to you as a friend almost from your long acquaintance with my son and knowledge of our story my age will be threescore years and ten if i live please god till my next birthday but i tell you david llewellyn and i beg you to mark my words i shall not die until i have seen the whole of this mystery cleared off the honour of my name restored and my innocent son replaced in the good opinion of mankind this calm brave faith of a long harassed man in the goodness of his maker made me look at him with admiration and with glistening eyes for i said to myself that with such a deep knave as chowne at the bottom of his troubles his confidence even in the lord was very likely to be misplaced and yet the very next day we made an extraordinary discovery which went no little way to prove the soundness of the old man's faith End of chapter forty seven chapter forty eight of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty eight a breathless disinterment by this time we were up to all the ins and outs of everything a sailor has such a knowledge of knots and the clever art of splicing that you cannot play loose tricks in trying on a yarn with him jerry toms and i were ready long before that day was out to tie up our minds in a bowline knot and never more undo them jerry went even beyond my views as was sure to be because he knew so much less of the matter he would have it that parson chowne had choked the two children without any aid and then in hatred and mockery of the noble british uniform had buried them deep in braunton burrows wearing a cockade for a shovel hat purely by way of outrage on the other hand while i agreed with jerry up to a certain distance i knew more of parson chowne whom he never had set eyes upon than to listen to such rubbish and while we agreed in the main so truly and thoroughly praised each other's wisdom all the people in the house made so highly much of us that jerry forgot the true line of reasoning even before nine o'clock at night and dissented from my conclusions so widely and with so much arrogance that it did not grieve me after he got up to have knocked him down like a ninepin however in the morning he was all right and being informed upon every side that the cook did it with the rolling-pin he acknowledged the justice of it having paid more attention to her than a married lady should admit though parted from her husband however she forgave him nobly and he did the same to her and i with all my knowledge of women made a vow in the presence of the lady housekeeper that my only uneasiness was to be certain whether i ought to admire the more jerry's behaviour or mrs cook's and the cook had no certainty in the morning exactly what she might have done 
this little matter made a stir far beyond its value and having some knowledge of british nature i proposed to the comitatus with deference both to the cook and housekeeper also a glance at the first housemaid that we should write all misunderstanding by dining together comfortably an hour before the usual time because as i clearly expressed it yet most inoffensively our breakfast had been ruined by a piece i might say of misconstruction overnight between two admirable persons and heaviside came in just then and put the cap on all of it by saying that true sailors were the greatest of all sportsmen therefore in honour of our arrival he had asked and got leave from the gamekeepers to give a great rabbiting that afternoon down on braunton burrows and he hoped that mrs cockhanterbury being the lady housekeeper would grace the scene with her presence and let every maid come to the utmost heaviside's speech though nothing in itself neither displaying any manner at all was received with the hottest applause and for some time jerry and i had to look at one another without any woman to notice us we made allowance for this of course although we did not like it for after all who was heaviside but we felt so sorely the ill effects of the absence of perfect harmony upon the preceding evening when all our male members of the human race took more or less the marks of knuckles that a sense of stiffness helped us to make no objection to anything and tenfold thus when we saw how the maids had made up their minds for frolicking these young things must have their way as well as the nobler lot of us for they really have not so very much less of mind than higher women have and they feel what a woman is too well to push themselves so forward they know their place and they like their place and they tempt us down into it be that either way and now unwomanly women waste their good brains upon a trifle of this kind rabbiting was to be our sport and no sooner was the dinner done and ten minutes given to the maids to dress than every dog on the premises worth his salt was whistled for it would have amused you to see the maids or i might say all the womankind coming out with their best things on and their hair done up and all pretending never even to have seen a looking-glass madame heaviside as she commanded all people to entitle her was of the whole the very grandest as regards appearance also in manner and carrying on but of this i have no time to speak enough that the former naval instructor thought it wiser to keep his own place and let her flirt with the gamekeepers we had dogs and ferrets and nets and spades and guns for those who were clever enough to keep from letting them off at all and to frighten the women without any harm there must have been five-and-twenty of us in number altogether besides at least a score of children who ran down from braunton village when they saw what we were at there was no restraint laid upon us by any presence of the gentry for sir philip was not in the humour for sport and the squire of course kept himself to his room and as for the captain we had no token of his return from south devon yet therefore we had the most wonderful fun enjoying the wildness of the place and the freshness of the river air and wilfulness of the sand-hills also the hide-and-seek of the rushes and the many ups and downs and pleasure of helping the young women in and out also how these latter got if they had any feet to be proud of into rabbit-holes on purpose to be lifted out of them and fill the rosettes of their shoes and have them dusted by a naval man's very best pocket-handkerchief together with the difficulty of standing on one foot while doing it or having it done to them and a fear of breathing too much out after smothered rabbit at dinner-time which made their figures look beautiful enough that i took my choice among them for consideration and jotted down the names of three who must have some cash from their petticoats let nobody for a moment dream that i started with this intention the rest of my life was to be devoted to the royal navy if only a hot war should come again of which we already felt simmerings but i could not regard all these things after so many years at sea without some desire for a further acquaintance with the meaning of everything at sea we forget a great deal of their ways when we come ashore there they are again 
this is a very childish thing for a man like me to think of nevertheless i do fall back from perfect propriety sometimes never as regards money but when my feelings are touched by the way in which superior young women try to catch me or when my opinion is asked conscientiously as to cordials and this same afternoon the noble clearness of the sun and air and the sound of merry voices glancing where all the world unless it were soft sand would have echoed them and the sense of going sporting which is half the game of it these and other things as well as the fatness of the rapids backs and great skill not to bruise them led the whole of us more or less into contemplation of nature's beauties we must have killed more than a hundred and fifty conies in one way and another when heaviside came up almost at a run to a hill where jerry toms and i were sitting down to look about a bit and to let the young women admire us what's the matter said i not liking to be interrupted thus matter enough he panted out where is madame the lord keep her away madame has gone down to the water side said jerry though i frowned at him together with that smart young fellow i forget his name under keeper they call him hurrah my hearties cried heaviside that is luck and no mistake now lend a hand every lubber of you her pet dog snap is in the sand with the devil to pay and no pitch hot if we take long to get him out again we knew what he meant for several dogs of an over-zealous character had got into premature burial in the rabbit galleries through the stupidity of people who crowded upon the cone over them some had been dug out alive and some dead according to what their luck was and now we were bound to dig out poor snap and woe to us all if we found him dead i took the biggest spade as well as the entire command of all of us and we started at quick step for the place which heaviside pointed out to us he told us so far as his breath allowed that his small brown terrier snap had found a rabbit of tender age hiding in a tuft of rushes snap put all speed on at once but young bunny had the heels of him and flipped up her tail at the mouth of a hole with an air of defiance which provoked snap beyond all discretion he scarcely stopped to think before he plunged with a yelp into the hole while another and a wiser dog came up and shook his ears at it for a little while they heard poor snap working away in great ecstasy scratching at narrow turns and yelping when he almost got hold of fur heavy side stood in his heavy way whistling into the entrance hole which went down from a steep ascent with a tuft of rushes over it but snap was a great deal too gamesome a dog to come back even if he heard him meanwhile a lot of bulky fellows who could do no more than clap their hands got on the brow of the burrow and stamped and shouted to snap to dig deeper then of a sudden the whole hill slided as a hollow fire does and cast a great part of itself into a deep gully on the north of it and those great louts who had sent it down so found it very hard and never deserved to get their clumsy legs out no wonder that heaviside had made such a run to come and fetch us for snap must be now many feet underground and the naval instructor knew what it would be to go home to nanette without him he stood above the slip and listened and there was no bark of snap while to my mind came back strangely thoughts of the five poor sons of scar and of the little child dwelling in sand forlorn and abandoned bardy dig away my lads dig away i cried from force of memory and setting example to every one i have seen a thing like this before it only wants quick digging we dug and dug and drove our pit through several decks of rabbit berths and still i cried dig on my lads although they said it was hopeless then suddenly some one struck something hard and cried hallo and frightened us we crowded round and i took the lead and made the rest keep back from me in right of superior discipline and thence i heaved out a beautiful cocked hat of a british captain of the royal navy with snap inside of it and not quite dead such a cheer and sound arose the moment that snap gave a little sniff from universal excitement and joy with heavy sight at the head of it that i feared to be hoisted quite out of the hole and mounted on human shoulders this 
i like well enough now and then having many a time deserved without altogether ensuing it but i could not stop to think of any private triumph now the whole of my heart was hot inside me through what i was thinking of that poor honest fellow who so eschewed the adornment of the outward man and carried out pure christianity so as to take no heed of what he wore or whether he wore anything whatever yet who really felt for people of a weaker cultivation to such an extreme that he hardly ever went about by day much this noble man had given evidence such as no man who had lost respect by keeping a tailor could doubt of in itself it was perspicuous and so was the witness before he put up with a sack in order to tender it the whole force of this broke upon me now while the others were showing the hat round or blowing into the little dog's nostrils and with a rabbit's tail tickling him because in a single glance i had seen that the hat was our captain bampfylde's and then i thought of old sir philip striding sadly along these burrows for ever seeking something dig away dig away my lads never mind the little dog let the maiden see to him under our feet there is something now worth a hundred thousand dogs all the people stood and stared and thought that i was off my wits and but for my uniform not one would ever have stopped to hearken me it was useless to speak to heaviside the whole of his mind was exhausted by anxiety as to his wife's little dog no sleep could he see before him for at least three lunar months unless little snap came round again so i had to rely on myself alone and jerry toms and two gamekeepers all these were for giving up because i can tell you it is no joke to throw out spadeful after spadeful of this heavy deceitful sand with half of it coming back into the hole and the place where you stand not steadfast and the rushes were combing darkly over us showing their ginger-coloured roots and with tufts of jagged eyebrows threatening overwhelment for our lives we worked away with me as seems to be my fate compelled to be the master and all the people looking down and ready to revile us if we could not find a stirring thing but we did find a stirring thing exactly as i will tell you for suddenly my spade struck something soft something which returned no sound and yet was firm enough to stop or at any rate to clog the tool although it was scarcely twilight yet and many people stood around us a feeling not of fear so much as horror seized upon me because this was not like the case of digging out poor bodies smothered by accident or the will of god but was something far more dreadful proof to wit of atrocious murder done by villainy of mankind upon two little helpless babes so that i scarce could hold the spade when a piece of white linen appeared through the sand and then some tresses of long fair hair and then two little hands crossed on the breast and a set of small toes sticking upward and close at hand lay another young body of about the same size or a trifle larger at this terrible sight the deepest breath of awe drew through all of us and several of the women upon the hill shrieked and dropped and the children fled and the men feared to come any nearer even my three or four fellow diggers leaped from the hole with alacrity leaving me all by myself to go on with this piteous disinterment for a moment i trembled too much to do so and leaned on my spade in the dusky grave watching the poor little things and loath to break with sacrilegious hands such innocent and eternal rest ye pure and stainless souls i cried hovering even now above us in your guardian angel's arms and appealing for judgment on your icy-hearted murderer pardon me for thus invading in the sacred cause of justice the calm sleep of your tenements in this sad and solemn moment with all the best spectators moved to tears by my deep eloquence as well as their own rich sympathies it struck me that the legs of one of the corpses stuck up rather strangely i had not been taken aback at all by the bright preservation of hands and toes because i knew well what the power of sand is when the air is kept far away but it was dead against all my experience that even a baby eight years buried should have that muscular power of leg without any further hesitation up i caught the nearest of them being desperate now to know what would be the end of it 
three or four women whose age had passed from lying in to laying out now ran down the hill in great zealousness but though their profession is perhaps the most needful of all yet invented by human nature there was no exercise for it now for behold in the evening light and on the brink of the grave were laid two very handsome and large dutch dolls clad in their nightgowns and looking as fresh as when they left the doll-maker's shop the sand remained in their hair of course and in their linen but fell away by reason of its dryness from their faces and hands and feet the whole of which were of fine hard wax but the joints of their arms and legs had stiffened from having no children to work them also their noses had been spoiled at some stage of their obsequies and upon the whole it seemed hard to say whether their appearance was more ludicrous or deplorable however that matter was settled for them by the universal guffaw of the fellows who had been scared of their scanty wits not more than two minutes since but all of whom now were as brave as lions to make laughter at my expense this is a thing which i never allow but very soon put a stop to it and so i did now without any hard words but turning their thoughts discreetly come my lads i said we have done a better turn to the gentleman who feeds us than if we had found two thousand babies such as you ran away from rally round me if you have a spark of courage in your loudish bodies you little know how much hangs on this while in your clumsy witless way you are making a stupid joke of it mr heaviside i pray you seek for me mistress cock hanterbury while i knock down any rogue who shows the impudence to come near me every man pulled his proud stomach in when i spoke of the lady housekeeper who was a tartar high up on a shelf allowing no margin for argument she appeared in the distance as managing women always do when called upon and she saw the good sense of what little i said and she laid them all under my orders End of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty nine one who has interred himself such an effect was now produced all over all around us that every man pressed for his neighbour's opinion rather than offer his own almost this is a state of the public mind that cannot be long put up with for half the pleasure goes out of life when a man is stinted of argument but inasmuch as i was always ready for all comers and would not for a moment hearken any other opinion the great bulk of conclusion ran into the grooves i laid for it this was neither more nor less than that satan's own chaplain chown was at the helm of the whole of it some people said that i formed this opinion through an unchristian recollection of his former rudeness to me i mean when he blew me out of bed and tried to drown and to burn me alive however the great majority saw that my nature was not of this sort but rather inclined to reflect with pleasure upon any spirited conduct and to tell the whole truth upon looking back at the parson i admired him more than any other man i had seen except captain nelson for it is so rare to meet with a man who knows his own mind thoroughly that if you find him add thereto a knowledge of his neighbours minds certain you may be that here is one entitled to lead the nation he may be almost too great to care about putting this power in exercise unless any grand occasion betides him just as parson chowne refused to go into the bishopric and just as nelson was vexed at being the supervisor of smugglers nevertheless these men are ready when god sees fit to appoint them however to come back to these dolls 
and the opening now before them the public although at first disappointed not to have found two real babies strangled in an experienced manner perceived the expediency of rejoicing in the absence of any such horror only there were many people of the lower order so disgusted at this cheat and strain upon their glands of weeping with no blood to show for it that they declared their firm resolve to have nothing more to do with it for my part being some little aware of the way in which laurels are stolen i kept my spade well up and the two dolls in my arms with their heads down and even their feet grudged to the view of the gossipers in the midst of an excited mob a calm sight of the right thing to do may lead them almost anywhere and i saw that the only proper thing was to leave everything to me they with that sense of fairness which exists in slow minds more than in quick ones fell behind me because all knew that the entire discovery was my own of course without snap i could never have done it nor yet without further accidents still there it was and no man even of our diffident welsh nation can in any fairness be expected to obscure himself my tendency throughout this story always has been to do this but i really did begin to feel the need of abjuring this national fault since men of a mixture of any sort without even celtic blood in them over and over again had tried to make a mere nobody of me hence it was and not from any desire to advance myself that among the inferior race i stood upon my rights and stuck to them if ever there had been any drop of desire for money left in me after perpetual purification from seven years of getting only coppers and finding most of them forgeries this scene was alone sufficient to make me glad of an empty purse for any man who has any money must long to put more to it as the children pile their farthings hoping how high they may go i like to see both old and young full of schemes so noble only they must let an ancient fellow like me keep out of them these superior senses glowed within me and would not be set aside by any other rogue preceding me when i knocked at sir philip's door and claimed first right of audience the other fellows were all put away by the serving-men as behooved them then i carried in everything just as it was and presented the whole with the utmost deference sir philip had inkling of something important and was beginning to shake now and then nevertheless he acknowledged my entrance with his wonted dignity signed to the footman to refresh the sperm oil lamps in the long dark room and then to me to come and spread my burden on a table nothing could more clearly show the self-command which a good man wins by wrestling long with adversity for rumour had reached him that i had dug up his son's cocked hat and his two grandchildren all as fresh as the day itself it is not for me who have never been so deeply stirred in the grain of the heart by heaven's visitations to go through and make a show of this most noble and ancient gentleman's doings or feelings or language even a man of low station like myself would be loath to have this done to him at many and many a time of his life so if i could even do it in the case of a man so far above me and so far more deeply harrowed instead of being proud of describing i must only despise myself enough to say that this snowy-haired most simple yet stately gentleman mixed the usual mixture of the things that weep and the things that laugh which are the joint stock of our nature from the old adam and the young one what i mean if i keep to facts is that he knelt on a strip of canvas laid at the end of the table and after some trouble to place his elbows because of the grit of the sandiness bowed his white forehead and silvery hair and the calm majesty of his face over those two dollies and over his son's very best cocked hat and in silence wept thanksgiving to the great father of 
everything david Ellen, he said as he rose and approached me as if i were quite his equal allow me to take your hand my friend there are few men to whom i would sooner owe this great debt of gratitude than yourself because you have sailed with my son so long to you and your patience and sagacity under the mercy of god i owe the proof or at any rate these tokens of my poor son's innocence i i thank the lord and you here the general for the moment could not say another word it is true your worship i answered that none of your own people showed the sense or the courage to go on but it is a welshman's honest pride to surpass all other races in valour and ability i am no more than the very humblest of my ancestors may have been then all of them must have been very fine fellows sir philip replied with a twinkling glance but now i will beg of you one more favour carry all these things just as they are to the room of my son mr philip bampfylde at first i was so taken aback that i could only gaze at him and then i began to think and to see the reason of his asking it i have asked you to do a strange thing good david if it is an unpleasant one say so in your blunt sailor's fashion your honour i answered with all the delicacy of my nature upwards say not another word i will do it for truly to speak it if anything had been often a grief and a care to me it was the bitterness of thinking of that squire philip deeply and not knowing anything the general bowed to me with a kindness none could take advantage of and signalled me to collect my burden then he appointed me how to go together with a very old and long accustomed servitor himself would not come near his son for fear of triumph over him after a long bit of tapping and whispering and the mystery servants always love to make of the simplest orders i was shown with my arms well aching for those wooden dolls were no joke and the captain's hat weighed a stone at least with all the sand in the lining into a dark room softly strewn and hung with ancient damask the light of the evening was shut out and the failure of the candles made it seem a cloudy starlight only in the furthest corner there was light enough to see by and there sat at a very old desk a white-haired man with his hat on if i can say one thing truly while i am striving at every line to tell the downright honesty this truth is that my bones and fibres now grew cold inside of me there was about this man so placed and with the dimness round him such an air of difference from whatever we can reason with and a far withdrawal from the ways of human nature as must send a dismal shudder through a genial soul like mine there he sat and there he spent three parts of his time with his hat on gazing at some old grey tokens of a happy period but so far as could be judged hoping fearing doing thinking even dreaming nothing he would not allow any clock or watch or other record of time in the chamber he would not read or be read to neither write or receive a letter there he sat with one hand on his forehead pushing back the old dusty hat with his white hair straggling under it and even below the gaunt shoulder-blades his face set a little on one side without any kind of meaning in it unless it were long weariness and patient waiting god's time of death i was told that once a day whenever the sun was going down over the bar in winter or summer in wet or dry this unfortunate man arose as if he knew the time by instinct without view of heaven and drew the velvet curtain back and flung the shutter open and for a moment stood and gazed with sorrow-worn yet tearless eyes upon the solemn hills and woods and down the gliding of the river following the pensive footfall of another receding day then with a deep sigh he retired from all chance of starlight darkening body mind and soul until another sunset 
upon the better side of my heart i could feel true pity for a man overwhelmed like this by fortune while my strength of mind was vexed to see him carry on so therefore straight i marched up to him when i began to recover myself having found no better way of getting through perplexity as my footsteps sounded heavily in the gloomy chamber squire philip turned and gazed at first with cold displeasure and then with strong amazement at me i waited for him to begin but he could not whether from surprise or loss of readiness through such long immurement may it please your honour i said the general has sent me hither to clear my captain from the charge of burying your honour's children what what do you mean was all that he could stammer forth while his glassy eyes were roving from my face to the dolls i bore and round the room and then back again exactly as i say your honour these are what the wild man took for your two children in braunton burrows and here is the captain's cocked hat which some one stole to counterfeit him the whole thing was a vile artifice a delusion cheat and mockery i need not repeat how i set this before him but only his mode of receiving it at first he seemed wholly confused and stunned pressing his head with both hands and looking as if he knew not where he was then he began to enter slowly into what i was telling him but without the power to see its bearing or judge how to take it he examined the dolls and patted them and added them to a whole school which he kept with two candles burning before them and then he said they have long been missing i am pleased to recover them then for a long time he sat in silence and in his former attitude quite as if his mind relapsed into its old condition and verily i began to think that the only result of my discovery so far as concerned poor squire philip would be a small addition to his gallery of dolls however after a while he turned round and cried with a piercing gaze at me mariner whoever you are i do not believe one word of your tale the hat is as new and the dolls are as fresh as if they were buried yesterday and i take that to be the truth of it how many years have i been here i know not bring me a looking-glass he pointed to a small mirror which stood among his precious relics being mounted with silver and tortoise-shell this had been as they told me afterwards the favourite toy of his handsome wife when i handed him this he took off his hat and shook his white hair back and gazed earnestly but without any sorrow at his mournful image twenty years at least he pronounced it in a clear decided voice twenty years it must have taken to have made me what i am would twenty years in a dripping sand-hill leave a smart gentleman's laced hat and a poor little baby's dolls as fresh and bright as the day they were buried old mariner i am sorry that you should lend yourself to such devices but perhaps you thought it right this although so much perverted made me think of his father's goodness and kind faith in every one and i saw that here was no place now for any sort of argument Your honour is altogether wrong i answered very gently the matter could have been at the utmost scarcely more than eight years ago according to what they tell me and if you can suppose that a man of my rank and age and service would lend himself to mean devices there are at least thirty of your retainers and of honest neighbours who have seen the whole thing and can swear to its straightforwardness and your honour of course knows everything a thousand times better than i do but of sand and how it keeps things everlasting so long as dry your honour seems if i may say it to have no experience he did not take the trouble to answer but fell back into his old way of sitting as if there was nothing worth argument people say that every man is like his father in many ways but the first resemblance that i perceived between sir philip and his elder son was that the squire arose and bowed with courtesy as i departed 
upon the whole this undertaking proved a disappointment to me and it mattered a hundredfold as much that our noble general was not only vexed but angered more than one could hope of him having been treated a little amiss i trusted that sir philip would contribute to my self-respect by also feeling angry still i did not desire more than just enough to support me or at the utmost to overlap me and give me the sense of acting aright by virtue of appeasing him but on the present occasion he showed so large and cloudy a shape of anger wholly withdrawn from my sight as happens with the peak of teneriffe also he so clearly longed to be left alone and meditate that i had no chance to offer him more than three opinions all these were of genuine value at the time of offering and must have continued so to be if the facts had not belied them allowing for this adverse view i will not even state them nevertheless i had the warmest invitation to abide and be welcome to the best that turned upon any of all the four great spits or simmered and lifted the pot lid suddenly for a puff of fine smell to come out in advance to a man of less patriotic feeling this might thus have commended itself but to my mind there was nothing visible in these hills and valleys and their sloping towards the sea which could make a true welshman doubt the priority of welshland for with us the sun is better and the air moves less increases and the sea has more of rapid gaiety in breaking the others may have higher cliffs or deeper valleys down them also if they like to think so darker woods for robbers nests but our own land has a sweetness and a gentle liking for us and a motherly pleasure in its bosom when we do come home to it such as no other land may claim according to my experience these were my sentiments as i climbed upon the ensuing sunday a lofty hill near the ifracombe road commanding a view of the bristol channel and the welsh coast beyond it the day was so clear that i could follow the stretches and curves of my native shore from the low lands of gower away in the west through the sandy ridges of aberavon and the grey rocks of scar and porthcall as far as the eastern cliffs of dunraven and the fading bends of st donats the sea between us looked so calm and softly touched with shaded lights and gentle variations also in unruffled beauty so fostering and benevolent that the white sailed coasters seemed to be babies fast asleep on their mother's lap how long is this mere river to keep me from my people at home i cried it looks as if one could jump it almost a child in a cockle-shell could cross it at these words of my own a sudden thought which had never occurred before struck me so that my brain seemed to buzz but presently reason came to my aid and i said no no it is out of the question without even a thread of sail i must not let these clods laugh at me for such a wild idea and the name in the stern of the boat as well downright santa lucia chowne must have drowned those two poor children and then rehearsed this farce of a burial with the captain's hat on to enable his man to swear truly to it tush i am not in my dotage yet i can see the force of everything End of chapter forty nine chapter fifty of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty a brave man runs away it may be the power of honesty or it may be strength of character coupled with a more than usual brightness of sagacity but whatever the cause may be the result seems always to be the same in spite of inborn humility to wit that poor old davy llewellyn wherever his ups and downs may throw him always has to take the lead this necessity as usual seemed to be arising now at narnton court the very last place in the world where one could have desired it since the present grand war began with the finest promise of lasting because nobody knows any cause for it so that it must be a law of nature i have not found much occasion to dwell upon common 
inland incidents these are in nature so far below all maritime proceedings that a sailor is tempted to forget such trifles as people are doing ashore even upon holy scripture since the stirring times began for me henceforth to chronicle it has not been my good luck to be able to sit and think of anything nevertheless i am almost sure that it must have been an active man of the name of nehemiah who drew for his rations every day one fat ox and six choice sheep and fowls of order various all of these might i have claimed if my capacity had been equal to this great occasion hence it may be well supposed that the kitchen was my favourite place whenever i deigned to enter into converse with the servants at first the head cook was a little shy but i put her soon at her ease by describing from my vast breadth of experience the proper manner to truss and roast a man and still better a woman the knowledge i displayed upon a thing so far above her level coupled with my tales of what we sailors did in consequence led this excellent creature so to appreciate my character and thirst for more of my narratives than i never could come amiss even at dishing up time but here i fell into a snare as every seaman is sure to do when he relaxes his mind too much in the charms of female society not concerning the cook herself for i gave her to understand at the outset that i was not a marrying man and she possessing a husband somewhere resolved not to hanker after me but by means of a fair young maid newly apprenticed to our head cook although of a loftier origin more than once while telling my stories i had obtained a little glimpse of long bright ringlets flashing and of shy young eyes just peeping through the hatch of the scullery door where the huckaback towel hung down from the roller and then on detection there used to ensue a very quick fumbling of small red hands as if being dried with a desperate haste in the old jack towel and then a short sigh and light feet retiring when this had happened for three or four times i gave my head cook a sudden wink and sprang through the scullery door and caught the little red hands in the fold of the towel and brought forth the owner in spite of deep blushes and even a little scream or two then i placed her in a chair behind the jack chains and continued my harrowing description of the way i was larded for roasting once by a score of unclothed gabooners also how the skewers of barwood thrust in to make me of a good rich colour when i should come to table had not that tenacity which our english wood is gifted with so that i was enabled to shake after praying to god for assistance my right arm out and then my left and after clapping both together to restore circulation it came providentially into my head to lay hold of the spit and charge them and then ensued such a scene as i could not even think of laying before young and delicate females this young girl whose so name was polly always at this pitch of terror not only shivered but shuddered so and needed support for her figure beyond the power of stays to communicate also let such tears begin to betray themselves and then retreat and then come out and defy the world with a brave sob at their back almost that i do not exaggerate in saying how many times i had the pleasure of roasting myself for the sake of them however it always does turn out that pleasures of this sort are transient and i could not have been going on with polly more than ten days at the utmost when i found myself in a rare scrape to be sure and this was the worst because sir philip so strongly desired my presence now perhaps in the vain hope of my convincing that obstinate squire of his brother's innocence when that brother should return now i need not have spoken as yet of miss polly if she had been but a common servant because in that case her peace of mind would have been of no consequence to the household but as it happened she was a person of no small importance by reason of the very lofty nature of her connections for she was no less than genuine niece to the lady housekeeper mrs cockhanterbury herself and hence she became the innocent cause of my departure from narnton court before i had time to begin my inquiries about the two poor little children 
this i had made up my mind to do as soon as that strange idea had crossed it while i was gazing upon the sea and my meaning was to go through all the traces that might still be found of them and the mode of their disappearance it is true that this resolve was weakened by a tempest which arose that very same evening after the channel had looked so insignificant and which might have been expected after that appearance nevertheless i must have proceeded according to my intention if my heart had not been too much for me in the matter of polly cockhanterbury being just now in my sixtieth year i could not prove such a coxcomb of course as to imagine that a pretty girl of two-and-twenty could care for me so that no course remained open to me as an honourable man and gallant british officer who studies his own peace of mind except to withdraw from this too tempting neighbourhood and in this resolution i was confirmed by mrs cockhanterbury's reluctance to declare in a binding manner her intentions towards her niece also by finding that somehow or other the whole of the ground floor at narnton court had taken it into their heads to regard me as a man of desirable substance it is possible that in larger moments when other people were boasting i may have insisted a little too much upon my position as landowner in the parish of newton nottage also i may have described too warmly my patronage of the schoolmaster and investment of cash with a view to encourage the literature of the parish but i never could have said what all of them deposed to such a very strong untruth as to convey the conclusion even to a devonshire state of mind that colonel lougher and i divided the whole of the parish between us be that as it may there was not any maid over thirty who failed to set her cap at me and my silver hair was quite restored to a youthful tinge of gold hence i was horrified at the thought that polly might even consent to have me for the sake of my property and upon discovering its poetical existence lead me a perfectly wretched life as bad as that of poor heaviside so that in spite of all attractions and really serious business and the important duty of awaiting the captain's return from pomeroy castle and even in spite of jerry tom's offer to take polly off my hands as if she would say a word to him and all the adjurations of poor heaviside who had defied his wife all the time i was there to back him up and now must have to pay out for it what did i do but agree to doff my uniform and work my passage on board the majestic a fore and aft rigged limestone boat of forty-eight tons and a half of course she was bound on the usual business of stealing the good colonel lower's rocks but i distinctly stipulated to have nothing to do with that my popularity now was such with all ranks of society also i found myself pledged for so many stories that same evening that i imparted to none except sir philip and polly and jerry toms and heaviside and one or two more the scheme of my sudden departure my mind was on the point of changing when i beheld sweet polly's tears until i felt that i must behave at my time of life as her father would because she had no father when i brought the majestic into shallow water off the tuscar every inch of which i knew it was no small comfort to me that i could not see the shore for years i had longed to see that shore and dreamed of it perpetually while tossing ten thousand miles away and now i was glad to have it covered with the twilight fogginess it suited me better to land at night only because my landing would not be such as i was entitled to and every one knows how the navy and army drop in public estimation when the wars seem to be done with therefore i expected little and i give you my word that i got still less it may have been over eleven o'clock but at any rate nothing to call very late just at the crest of the summer-time when i gave three good strong raps at the door of my own cottage knowing exactly where the knots were i had not met a single soul to know me or to speak my name although the moon was a quarter old and i found a broken spar and bore it as i used to bear my fishing-pole no man who has not been long a-roving can understand all the fluttering ways of a man's heart when he comes home again how he looks at every one of all the old houses he knows so well at first as if he feared it for having another piece built on or grander people inside of it and then upon finding this fear vain he is almost ready to beg its pardon for not having looked at it such a long time it is not in him to say a word to or even about the children coming out thus to stare at him all the children he used to know are gone to day's work long ago 
and the new ones would scarcely trust him so as to suck a foreign lollipop he knows them by their mothers but he cannot use their names to them there is nothing solid dwelling for a poor man long away except the big trees that lay hold upon the ground in earnest and the tombstones keeping up his right to the parish churchyard along the wall of this i glanced with joy to keep outside of it while i struck for the third time strongly at not being let into mine own house at last a weak and faltering step sounded in my little room and then a voice came through the latch-hole man of noise how dare you thus you will wake up our young lady master roger let me in know you not your own landlord the learned schoolmaster was so astonished that he could scarcely draw back the bolt is it so is it so indeed i thank the lord for sending thee was all he could say while he stood there shaking both my hands to the very utmost that his slender palms could compass friend llewellyn he whispered at last i beg thy pardon heartily for having been so rude to thee but it is such a business to hush the young lady and if she once wakes she talks all the night long i fear that her mind is almost too active for a maid of her tender years what young lady do you mean i asked is bunny become a young lady now bunny he cried with no small contempt then perceiving how rude this was to me began casting about for apologies never mind that i said only tell me who this wonderful young lady is miss andalusia the maid of scar as every one now begins to call her there is no other young lady in the neighbourhood to my knowledge nor in the whole world for you i should say by the look of your eyes master roger burke rolls nevertheless put your coat on my friend and give your old landlord a bit to eat i trow that the whole of my house does not belong even to miss delushy have i not even a granddaughter to be sure and a very fine damsel she is ay and a good and comely one though she hath no turn for erudition what we should do without bunny i know not she is a most rare young housewife the tears sprang into my eyes at this as i thought of her poor grandmother and i gave master burke roll's hand a squeeze which brought some into his as well let me see her was all i said it is not easy to break her rest unless she is greatly altered she is not in bed she is singing her young friend to sleep i will call her presently this was rather more however than even my patience could endure so i went quietly up the stairs and pushing the door of the best room gently there i heard a pretty voice and saw a very pretty sight in a little bed which seemed almost to shine with cleanliness there lay a young girl fast asleep but lying in such a way that none who had ever seen could doubt of her that is to say with one knee up and the foot of the other leg thrown back and showing through the bedclothes as if she were running a race in sleep and yet with the back laid flat and sinking into the pillow deeply while a pair of little restless arms came out and strayed on the coverlet her full and lively red lips were parted as if she wanted to have a snore also her little nose well up and the rounding of the tender cheeks and trimmed to the maiden oval down upon these dark lashes hung fluttering with the pulse of sleep while heavy clusters of curly hair dishevelled upon the pillow framed the gentle curve of the forehead and smiling daintiness of the whole near this delicate creature sat in a bending attitude of protection a strong and well-made girl with black hair jet black eyes and a rosy colour spread upon a round plump face she was smiling as she watched the effect of an old welsh air which she had been singing ard hide e nos to look at her size and figure you would say that her age was fourteen at least but i knew that she was but twelve years old as she happened to be our bunny you may suppose that this child was amazed to see her old granny again once more and hardly able to recognize him except by his voice and eyes and manner and a sort of way about him such as only relations have for really if i must tell the truth the great roundness of the world had taken such a strong effect upon me that i had not been able to manage one straight line towards newton nottage for something over six years now perhaps i have said that the admiralty did not encourage our correspondence and most of us were very well content to allow our dear friends to think of us so that by my pay alone could my native parish argue whether i were alive or dead it would not become me to enter into the public rejoicing upon the morrow after my well-accustomed face was proved to be genuine at the jolly 
there are moments that pass our very clearest perception and judgment and even our strength to go through them again and it was too early yet except for a man from low latitudes to call for rum and water the whole of this i let them know while capable of receiving it End of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifty one triple education master roger burke rolls had proved himself a schoolmaster of the very driest honesty this expression upon afterthought i beg to use expressly my own honesty is of a truly unusual and choice character and i have not found say a dozen men fit anyhow to approach it but there is always a sense of humour and a view of honour wagging in among my principles to such an extent that they never get dry as the multiplication table does master burke rolls was a man of too much mind for joking therefore upon the very first morning after my return and even before our breakfast time he poured me out such a lot of coin as i never did hope to see himself regarding them as no more than so many shells of the sea to count all these he had saved from my pay in a manner wholly beyond my imagination because though i loved to make money of people i soon let them make it of me again and this was my instinct now but roger laid his thin hand on the heap most gravely and through his spectacles watched me softly so that i could not be wroth with him friend llewellyn i crave your pardon all this money is lawfully yours neither have i or anybody the right to meddle with it but i beg you to consider what occasions may arise for some of these coins hereafter also if it should please the lord to call me away while you are at sea what might become of the dear child bunny without this mammon to procure her friends would you have her like poor andalusia dependent upon charity hush i whispered too late however for there stood bardie herself a slim light-footed and graceful child about ten years old just then i think her dress of slate-coloured stuff was the very plainest of the plain and made by hands more familiar with the needle than the scissors no ornament or even change of colour was she decked with not so much as a white crimped frill for the fringes of hair to dance upon no child that came to the well so long as she possessed a mother ever happened to be dressed in this denying manner but two girls blessed with good stepmothers having children of their own were endued as was known already with dresses cut from the self-same remnant now as she looked at roger burke rolls with a steadfast wonder not appearing for the moment to remember me at all a deep spring of indefinite sadness filled her dark grey eyes with tears charity she said at last if you please sir what is charity charity my dear is kindness the natural kindness of good people is it what begins at home sir as they say in the copy-books yes my dear but it never stops there it is a most beautiful thing it does good to everybody you heard me say my dear child that you are dependent on charity it is through no fault of your own remember but by the will of god you need not be ashamed to depend on the kindness of good people her eyes shone for a moment with bright gratitude towards him for reconciling her with her pride and then being shy at my presence perhaps she turned away just as she used to do and said to herself very softly i would rather have a home though i would rather have a home and a father and mother of my own instead of beautiful charity master burke rolls told me when she was gone that many children of the place had no better manners than to be always shouting after her when coming back from the sandhills where's your father where's your mother where's your home delushy this of course was grievous to her and should never have been done and i let roger know that his business was to stop any scandal of this kind but he declared that really the whole of his mind was taken up and much of his body also in maintaining rule and reason through the proper hours after school-time it was not the place of the schoolmaster but of the parson of the parish 
or by deputy churchwardens or failing them the clerk and if he were out of the way the sexton to impress a certain tone of duty on the young ones especially the sexton need not even call his wife to help if he would but have the wit to cultivate more young thoughtfulness by digging a grave every other day and trusting the lord for orders it was not long before delushy learned some memory of me partly with the aid of bunny partly through the ship i made such as no other man could turn out partly through my uniform and the rest of it by means of goodness only can tell what a man who is knocked about all over rounds and flats and sides of mountains also kicked into and out of every hole and corner and the strong and weak places of the earth and upset after all the most by his fellow-creatures doings although he may have started with more principle than was good for him comes home in the end to look at results far more than causes this was exactly mine own case i can hardly state it more clearly i wanted no praise from anybody because i felt it due to me a fellow who doubts about himself may value approbation and such was the case with me perhaps while misunderstood by the magistrates but now all the money which i had saved under stewardship of burke rolls enabled all my household to stand up and challenge calumny there is a depth of tender feeling in the hearts of welshmen such as cannot anywhere else be discovered by a welshman heartily we love to find man or woman of our own kin even at the utmost nip of the calipers of pedigree doing anything which reflects a spark of glory on us of this man or woman even we make all the very utmost to the extremest point where truth assuages patriotism the whole of our neighbourhood took this matter from a proper point of view and sent me such an invitation to a public dinner that i was obliged to show them all the corners of the road when the stupid fellows thought it safer to conduct me home again upon that festive occasion also sandy macraw took a great deal too much so entirely in honour of me that i felt the deepest goodwill towards him before the evening was over even going so far it appears as to discharge him from all back rent for the use of my little frigate i certainly could not remember such an excess of generosity upon the following morning until he pulled off his hat and showed me the following document inscribed with a pencil on the lining dearest and best of friends after the glorious tribute paid by the generous scotchman to the humble but warm-hearted cambrian the latter would be below contempt if he took a penny from him signed david llewellyn witness rees hopkins chairman his mark after this and the public manner of my execution there was nothing to be said except that sandy macraw was below contempt for turning to inferior use the flow of our finest feelings therefore i went with some indignation to resume possession of my poor boat which might as well have been sandy's own during the last five years and more however i could not deny that the scotchman had kept his part of the contract well for my boat was beautifully clean and in excellent repair in a word as good as new almost so i put miss delushy on board of her with bunny for the lady's mate and finding a strong ebb under us i paddled away towards scar and landed bravely at pool tavern for poor black evan lay now in our churchyard by the side of his live bold sons having beheld the white horse as plainly as any of the coroner's jury the reason was clear enough to all who know anything of medicine to wit his unwise and pernicious step in prostituting his constitution to the use of water if any unfortunate man is harassed with such want of self-respect and utter distrust of providence as well as unpleasancy of behaviour towards all worthy neighbours and black ingratitude to his life as to make a vow for ever never to drink any good stuff again that man must be pitied largely but let no one speak harshly of him because he must so soon be dead and this in half the needful time if formerly he went on too much poor moxy now with young watkin only carried on this desert farm it was said that no farmer ever since the abbots were turned out could contrive to get on at scar one after the other failed to get a return for the money sunk into the desolate sandy soil black evan's father took the place with a quarter of a bushel heaped with golden guineas of queen anne and very bravely he began but nothing ever came of it except that he hanged himself at last and left his son to go on with it 
what chance was there now for moxy with no money and one son only and a far better heart than head nevertheless she would not hear for one moment of such a thing as giving up to lushy this little maid had a way of her own of winding herself into people's hearts given to her by the lord himself to make up for hard dealings moxy loved her almost as much as her own son watkin and was brought with the greatest trouble to consent to lose her often for the sake of learning because there never could be at scar the smallest chance of growing strongly into education and everybody felt that bardie was of a birth and nature such as demanded this thing highly however even this public sentiment might have ended in talk alone if lady bluett had not borne in mind her solemn pledge to me roger burkrolls would have done his best of course to see to it but his authority in the parish hung for a while upon female tongues which forced him to be most cautious so that i though seven years absent am beyond doubt entitled to the credit of this child's scholarship i had seen the very beginning of it as i must have said long ago but what was that compared with all that happened in my absence burke rolls was a mighty scholar knowing every book almost that ever in reason ought to have been indicted or indicted and his calm opinion was that he never had led into letters such a mind as bardie's she learned more in a week almost than all the rising generation sucked in for the quarter not a bit of milching knowledge could he gently offer her ere she dragged the whole of it out of his crop like a young pigeon feeding and sometimes she would put such questions that he could do nothing more than cover both his eyes up all such things are well enough for people who forget how much the body does outweigh the mind being meant of course to do so getting more food as it does and able to enjoy it more by reason of less daintiness but for my part i have always found it human prudence to prevent the mind or soul or other parts invisible from conspiracy to outgo what i can see and feel and manage and be punished for not heeding that is to say my body now the plan arranged for bardie was the most perfect that could be imagined springing from the will of providence and therefore far superior to any human invention master burke rose told me that a human being may be supposed to consist principally of three parts the body which is chiefly water this i could not bear to hear of unless it were salt water which he said might be the case with me the mind which may be formed of air if it is formed of anything and the soul which is strong spirit and for that reason keeps the longest accordingly this homeless maiden's time was so divided that her three parts were provided for one after other most beautifully she made her rounds with her little bag from scar to candleston court and thence to master burke rolls at my cottage and back again to scar when moxy could not do without her she would spend perhaps a fortnight at candleston then a fortnight in newton village and after that a month at scar more or less as might be according to the weather and the chances of conveyance at candleston of course she got the best of bodily food as well but lady bluett made a point of attending especially to her soul not in a sanctimonious way but concerning grace and manners and the love of music and the handling of a knife and fork and all the thousand little things depending on that part of us and here she was made a most perfect pet and wore very beautiful clothes and so on but left them all behind and went as plain as a nun to newton as soon as the time arrived for giving her mind its proper training now when her mind was ready to burst with the piles of learning stored in it and she could not sleep at night without being hushed by means of singing moxy would come from scar to fetch her and scold both the master and bunny well for the paleness of delushy's face and end by begging their pardon and bearing the child away triumphantly with watkin to carry the bag for her and then for a month there was play and sea air and rocks to climb over and sand-hills and rabbits and wild fowl to watch by the hour and bathing throughout the summer-time and nothing but very plain food at regular intervals of fine appetite so the over-active mind sank back to its due repose and the tender cheeks recovered with kind nature's nursing all the bloom the flowers have because they think of nothing also the lightsome feet returned and the native grace of movement and the enjoyment of good runs and laughter unrepressed but made harmonious by discipline and then the hair came into gloss and the eyes to depths of brightness and all the mysteries of wisdom soon were tickled out of her this was the life she had been leading now for some six years or more and being of a happy nature she was quite contented 
in the boat i did my utmost that day to examine her as to all her recollections of her early history but she seemed to dwell upon nothing now except the most trifling incidents such as a crab lifting up the cover one day when old davy was boiling him or dutch being found with a lot of small dutches and nobody knew where they came from she had no recollection of any boat or even a coroner's inquest and as to papa and mamma and brother she put her hand up to her beautiful forehead to think and then wondered about them having cleverly brought you thus to a proper acquaintance with the present situation i really think that you must excuse me from going into all moxie's transports called forth by the sight of me in spite of all that i always say in depreciation of myself i and often mean it too nobody can have failed to gather that my countrymen at large and which matters more my countrywomen take a most kind view of me and it would have been hard indeed if moxie could not find a tear or two and watkin now was a fine young fellow turned of twenty some time ago straight as an arrow and swift as a bird but shy as a trout in a mountain stream from a humble distance he admired miss delushy profoundly and was ever at her beck and call so that of course she liked him much but entertained a feminine contempt for such a fellow End of chapter fifty one